Isaiah 5 has proven to be a really rich, deep chapter. I'm glad we've taken the time that we have over it. And uh, if you think there's only a few verses left and we're going to skim, I'm, we're going to struggle to get it all in because there's a lot more here for us to see tonight. But let's, uh, let's read through. We're up to verse 24. Um, and we'll read through and we'll pray and then we'll, we'll study. Um, we've, uh, we've been in this section following the Song of the Vineyard that has been the series of six woes and four therefores. The woes of a judgment uh, are the, the reason for the judgment and the therefores are the actions of the judgment. And we've done the six woes and we've done two of the therefores and we're now into the last two therefores. So I'm reading from verse 24. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble, and as dry, uh, dry grass sinks down in the flame, so their root will be as rottenness, and their blossom go up like dust. For they have rejected the law of, the, of Yahweh of hosts, and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of Yahweh has kindled against his people, and he stretched out his hand against them and struck them. When the mountains quaked, and their corpses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. He will raise a signal for nations far away, and whistle for them from the ends of the earth. And behold, quickly, speedily they come. None is weary, none stumbles, none slumbers or sleeps. Not a waistband is loose, not a sandal strap is broken. Their arrows are sharp and their bows are bent. Their horse hooves seem like flint and their wheels like the whirlwind. Their roaring is like a lion. Like young lions they roar, they growl and seize their prey. They carry it off and none can rescue. They will growl over it on that day like the growling of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and distress and the light is darkened by its clouds. Let's pray. Father, we pray as we come to this passage that you would richly bless our time. We pray that we would be enlightened, encouraged, and ever more uh, focused upon you, Lord. May our devotion be enhanced this evening through the study of your word, we pray. Amen. Okay, so... The last two therefores. Here we are. We're again just a reminder of context. We're we're in the the chapter of the Song of the Vineyard. So what we're dealing with here is all part of that same context of chapter five. So remember the Song of the Vineyard. The, Yahweh has his vineyard, which is Israel. He gives everything that it needs to be productive and fruitful. And when the time of harvest comes, he only gets rotten grapes, stinky grapes, nasty grapes that, that are, are wasted and can't be used. And so because of that, he is going to do uh, all that follows. If you saw, uh, look in verse, um, uh, verse 5, now I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, to my vineyard, I'll remove its hedge, it shall be devoured, I'll break down its walls and be trampled on, it will be a waste, it won't be pruned or hoed, the briars and thorns shall grow up, and I'll also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. In other words, because the vineyard has been unfruitful, he will not nurture it, and in fact, he will destroy it. And the woes and the judgments immediately follow the song of the vineyard because this is the result of their sin and their lack of fruitfulness. So, that's where we are contextually. And the vineyard uh, analogy comes back here as he talks of the stubble in verse 24 there's a tongue of fire devours the stubble as dry grass sinks down in the flames so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will go up like dust so when you have stubble uh i mean i this is all familiar to me i grew up in a farming family my grandfather uh was a farmer had a whole bunch of land and every uh, autumn time that the after harvest they would have you know harvest of wheat and the wheat would be harvested and then there would be left just the stubble and 
then I don't know, some point in my latter childhood, perhaps my teenage years in the UK, they passed regulations regarding, regarding the legality of burning. But when I was a younger child, what used to happen is the farmers would just take that stubble and they'd set light to it. So that once they'd basically got the harvest and they'd harvested the wheat, everything that remained, they would just set fire and it would burn up and Sometimes, at this, this, this kind of time of year, you'd be driving around the country roads and you'd have to put your windows up because there'd be smoke blowing everywhere from the, the fires of the stubble. The stubble was of no use, and so it was simply burnt up. And we know the concept of dry grass being just consumed by flames. You've only got to look at the uh, forest fires we have around here. And, I mean, we call them forest fires, don't we? But there's not much of a, of a, of a forest uh, up on the Verdugos behind us. There is lots and lots of dry grass that burns very easily. So I think we're all familiar with the concept. And the application of it, it is simply this, that the picture is one of this vineyard that's been unproductive. And in the same way that stubble, which is useless and all the value is of, the, of the harvest has been taken, the stubble is just left over and useless and the dry grass is just of no value. It all just gets burnt up. And in the same way, the roots and the blossom of the harvest are burnt up, in, of, the, of the vineyard are burnt up. And the idea is really when we're talking about roots and blossom, we're talking about the horticultural equivalent of from the top of your head to, the, to, the, to your toes. You're talking about alpha to omega. You're talking about beginning to end. In other words, you're creating a picture of the entirety of the vineyard. God says the whole thing is worthless, and so it's all going to be burnt up by fire. These, these stinky grapes um, are useless and therefore the vineyard is only fit for burning. I've made occasional reference to the literary genius of Isaiah and uh, I didn't get the exact phrase but I think I'm right in saying that the word is an onomatopoeia. Is bang an example of onomatopoeia? Is that the right way to see it? I knew Robert would know. <laughs> he would have the answer. Onomatopoeia I had confirmed, is the word that speaks of words whose, whose terminology is the same as the sound it makes. So bang sounds like a bang. And Isaiah uses onomatopoeias here, three separate syllables in this verse, which make the sound of hissing, like hissing flames when it's burning. Really clever stuff. And so the entirety is burnt up, and he speaks of it in this uh, very poetic fashion. And the reason for the burning is very clear in the second half of verse 24. For, this is the reason why, they have rejected the law of Yahweh of hosts, and they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Classic Hebrew imagery, the, the duality of it, the, the two phrases paralleling one another. They have rejected, ultimately, revelation from God. That's what they've rejected. Each of these two phrases is saying Israel has rejected God's revelation. But it does so in a couple of different ways, which is quite clever. When it's the first half, it specifically says that uh, they have rejected the law. So that is more formally talking about Moses. Um, Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, specifically, the, the, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, as we might call them. And then when we have the next phrase, um, he's rejected the law of the Lord, and he's despised, they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That word almost certainly, contextually, will refer to the word, the spoken word of the prophets. And so it's talking here about the prophets and the law and how they've rejected both. And again, in the same way that you have roots and blossom, talking of entirety, here with the law and the word, you have the entirety of God's revelation at this time to these people. They've rejected God's word. Notice also the two different terms for God, which I think are quite important. Verse, uh, the first one, rather, is the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts. Again, as I've said before, the terminology here, Yahweh of hosts, does two things. Firstly, it has the name of God, the very name, Yahweh, and therefore it's emphasizing God and his personality, who he is as a person. But with hosts, literally armies, it's talking about the might of God. 
And it is because they've rejected the revelation of the mighty warrior God that we're going to see what we see following in the uh, subsequent verses. The other phrase that is used, they despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. That's the name of God that was used previously in verse 19. It's being repeated here now twice in this section. And that's very important because the holiness of God is going to be in our minds at the end of this section as we come into chapter 6. So much of these five chapters has really, the main purpose of the entirety of these five chapters has been to set us up for chapter 6. We'll talk more about that next time. But chapter 6 is the calling. And most times, you know, if we're going to hear about a calling, that's what starts the prophetic revelation. But Isaiah 1 to 5 has set us up, and it's things like this. They have despised the holy God. They've despised his word. And this is all preparing us for the imagery that we're going to see as we come in to chapter 6. We'll mention that more in a little while. So, the, therefore, the, 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 the third therefore then is the devouring of uh, Israel in judgment represented by fire in its entirety because of their rejection of God's word in its entirety and their rejection of God himself in his entirety. It is a picture of completeness, complete rejection of God in every sense and therefore the complete destruction. That is the result of the woes that we have seen. The final woe is in verse 25. And we're told in verse 25, Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people. He stretched out his hand against them and struck them, and the mountains quaked. Now, the word here for anger is interesting. I noted way back, I think in chapter 2, that we came across several words for sin in one passage. And Isaiah, because he talks about sin a lot, he, you know, I don't know the exact number, and I'm sure if I found the quotation it would be an urban legend and exaggerated, but apparently, they, they don't they say the Eskimos have so many different words for snow and or ice, you know? The idea is that when you're surrounded by snow and ice, you see all the various types, whereas if you live in California, it's just snow or ice. <laughs> you only need one or two words because you don't see it much. And because Isaiah is dealing so richly with the sin of Israel, then Isaiah uses multiple different words for sin that emphasize different facets of sin and their sinfulness. In the same way, because of their sin, God is angry. God's wrath is there against their sin. And so there are multiple words that Isaiah uses for anger. When it comes to anger, and again, I'm using English words here to communicate the Hebrew, and of course, different translations will use different words, but generally speaking, we have terms of anger. One of them would be one that you could, generally speaking, translate as impatience, just the frustration of God. There is a word used for anger by Isaiah that is translated typically as rage. It comes from the root hot. And there is a related word that um, essentially means burn, that is translated as God's fury. Another word is translated as vexation. Another one, indignation. And then we have a word whose root meaning is passing over or going beyond. And in the context of anger, it's translated as an outburst. So God who passes over sin... The angel of death passing over, there is God passing over the normal bounds and having an outburst of anger. And then there is another word meaning a storm of anger from the Lord. And the one that we have before us here is yet another one which is typically translated as exasperation. I mean, you can translate them all as anger, but you kind of lose the whole point of having multiple words, don't you, when you translate them all the same way. But this type of anger is an anger that is personally felt and expressed. Something that is 
is, is something that is very personal to someone and affects them very deeply. And I think that it's interesting that it says that in the context, the anger of Yahweh. It has the personal name of God with the word for anger that means a personal felt anger. And it is literally, if you want to translate it more literally, it is, comes from a root of meaning to snort. It's an exasperation. It is a frustration. And you have that here because it is the anger, exasperation of Yahweh personally kindled against his people. Do you see the connection of all those concepts? Personal anger from the personal God to his own people. All that is linked together. This is something that isn't just some distant God saying, wrath be upon you, you little ants. This is God with his own people whom he dearly loves. This is the song of the vineyard being expressed here. This is all the context of the vineyard. This was his vineyard that he planted, that he loved, that he took care of, that he prepared for, that was supposed to give good fruit, and he was disappointed by the outcome. This is something that is deeply personal to God. And so the anger here is a personal anger, an exasperation, because of the personal nature of what has happened here. And so we're told he stretched out his hand. And the hand of God and the arm of God, these are used in the sense of God's might, God's power. His hand comes out, his hand is upon this person or this nation. And it speaks of God's might. And so because of his frustration, exasperation, he stretches out his hand against them and he struck them. And the mountains quaked. Now, I've got two things to say about the mountains quaking. Firstly, if you, like me, come from a more charismatic background, much of the charismatic church has taken the concept of mountains trembling as being this wonderful thing. Oh, the presence of God, the trembling mountains. You know, I remember in my youth thing, singing songs along the lines of, did you feel the mountains tremble? Like this would be a wonderful thing. It's classic taking verses out of context. The trembling of the mountains is almost always associated with the anger of God, the wrath of God, as here in this context, and as elsewhere multiple times. In fact, um, I'll just read to you very, very briefly. You don't have to turn there. Psalm 18, verse 7 is another good example. The earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked. Why? Because he was angry. That's why the mountains shake and tremble. The wrath of God, God's judgment affects the earth. God's judgment affects the earth. Now, because of that principle, there's I could preach a whole sermon on this topic. I don't want to get distracted by this theme. But I do want to point to two future incidents, one near and one far. The near one is that we'll see this in, in the next few weeks. But in chapter 6 and verse 4, just literally a few verses away, when we have the vision of the temple, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, and verse 4, and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. The holiness of God is linked with the anger of God against sin and the trembling and shaking. Can you see how that all connects? End of chapter 5, you've despised the word of the Holy One of Israel, and as a result of your despising the word of the Holy One, there is the anger of God and the shaking of the mountains. And now here, on the mountain where the temple is, the foundations are shaking because in the presence of the holiness of God. That is too close for it not to be connected. That is us leading into chapter 6. That's a kind of a good example of a close connection. That is what we call inner textuality. The Bible relating to something within the same book in the near vicinity. But then if you go further on, the whole concept is taken... Um, I don't have it uh, um, marked. I'll just turn there real quick. But you'll be familiar with this, I have no doubt. But... Um, then what happens later on is um, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 22, for we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth 
until now. And so the idea in the Old Testament is that the earth is affected by the judgment of God, so when the redemption of humanity comes, so the earth sees redemption as well. So that whole concept and, and, and uh, idea is carried through right the way into the New Testament. And uh, so the mountains are trembling. Now, with the mountains trembling, is that something that is simply figurative? Well, clearly it is figurative as well. Therefore, when you hear talk of trembling mountains, trembling this and that, then, then clearly it is point, painting a picture of God's anger. But the idea is not limited to figurative speech. When we see in the next chapter the foundations of a temple shaking, I don't think any of us would presume anything other than the foundations are literally trembling. It speaks as well of God's holiness and his, his holiness and his wrath against sin, but nevertheless we're, we're visualizing them actually shaking. And some scholars here suggest that the quaking mountains here may refer to a literal earthquake. In uh, Zechariah chapter 14, in passing, in reference to another passage, it does mention an earthquake that was a historical event that happened in the, during the reign of Uzziah. And remember, in chapter 6, we see that it was when Uzziah dies that Isaiah is called. So if he's speaking in chapter 5 about um, an earthquake, literally, then there was one in very recent history. There was one just leading up until the, the time of Uzziah's death at some point before that. And, the, and the thing, there's two things that may well support that, one from inside the passage and one from another passage. The, the one from another passage is many of the minor prophets are very heavily dependent on Isaiah. They take Isaiah and they, they take the revelation a little bit further. They, they unpack it a little bit more. There's greater revelation that God gives, but it's based on what Isaiah has said. And Amos, the book of Amos, starts by saying the words of Amos among the shepherds of Tekoa, when he saw, uh, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, a son of jo uh, Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So there's a mention there to the earthquake. And what does he say in the next verse? In, in Amos 1-2, the first judgment is, and he said, the Lord roars from Zion. We're going to see roaring in the next couple of verses here in Isaiah. So the two passages seem to be linked. I know Amos is preaching historically slightly before Isaiah, but there's some indication perhaps that Amos was actually written after Isaiah. We don't know for sure, but clearly they're linked together. And so it seems to me there's a good possibility from that that this may be a reference to a literal earthquake that God allowed as part of the judgment of Israel. Another reason for that would be at the end of this verse, it says, and their corpses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. When you have an earthquake, that's something that tends to happen, is you end up with lots of bodies basically being there in, in the open, and it's the nature of what happens. And so perhaps, perhaps, not definitely, tentatively, there may well be a literal earthquake here. And if there is an earthquake there, it's clear, this is, this is clear. Hey, God's judgment made the mountains tremble, brought about this earthquake, that's his wrath, that's his hand, his hands reached out, it struck you for your sin, so is he done? No. For all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. This is your therefore, the result of your woes, the result of your sin. This is what happened, is that God's judgment is upon you. You're seeing the fruit of that judgment. You're seeing the burning flames right now in your midst and it's not over and it's not done and it's not finished because your sin is so great. That is the implication. Now, verses 26 through 30 is really the explanation. It, it, it is the, the, the outworking of verse 25. In verse 25, God says, hey, I'm not done. There's more judgment coming for you. And verses 26 to 30 is the explanation of that judgment. And the judgment is going to come through other nations, through another nation. Verse 26 makes that clear. He will raise a signal for nations far away. And he will whistle for them 
from the ends of the earth. The, the phrase translated here, raise a signal, is what would happen is with armies, they would take a, a tall staff with a flag upon it and the colors would fly like a, 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 you know, a rallying cry. They put it upon a mountain for all to see and then the armies would know where to come and to gather because they would gather around the flag. So if you were the commander of an army, you place your flag up on a nice big bare mountain where it can be seen, and then the, the troops will come and gather around the flag to go to war. And the picture being painted here is this, that God is going to summon an army. He's going to summon them, he's going to raise a signal, he's going to call for them, he's going to whistle for them. And the same phrase, by the way, in chapter se- uh, is used in chapter 7, where the term whistle is also used to God calling the Assyrians. Again, chapter first five chapters are your foundation for Isaiah. All of these themes and everything just follows through the rest of the book. And here is, here is the principle of God calling the nations to, to do his bidding, to do his will, to bring judgment in his name. And chapter 7, when the Assyrians are called, we will see that working out in more practice. What's fascinating to me as well is that this summoning, this raising of the signal, summoning the army to come, is referring to a a, a, a nation of Gentiles who are going to do God's bidding. And yet the same phrase is going to be used later in chapter 11, where God raises the flag summons together the remnant. And so, in in the same way that God sovereignly says, I'm going to call this Gentile army to come against Israel in judgment, the same terminology is used when God says, I'm going to call my remnant and preserve this nation to whom I have made these promises. And we see this constantly in Isaiah. We see God's judgment coming against Israel because of its sin. And we see God's faithfulness to Israel despite their unfaithfulness and his preserving of the remnant of Israel. And so it's no accident that the same terminology is used in both cases. Listen, as I go through Isaiah, I don't think I'm going to have the time. But I think one of the most fascinating studies would be would be to take the first five chapters of Isaiah, somebody who's much cleverer than me, who knows their Hebrew really well, just take the first five chapters and look at how all the words, all the concepts, all the themes are developed through the rest of the book. And I'd be fairly certain that almost every single theme that is developed in the book of Isaiah is, finds its genesis in these first five chapters. I have a similar thesis, by the way, for John's Gospel, and I'm even more clear on that one, that everything in John's Gospel is originally found in the prologue in the first 18 verses. I think this, this, this foundation is so crucial, and it's little things like that, the summoning of Gentile armies, and then that being expressed in more detail later, and the summoning of the remnant as a contrast to that. And so, ultimately, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the sovereignty of God even over the nations. And and there's there's deliberate irony here. God says, Israel, you are my people. I'm going to give you everything you need and you're going to be, have this fruit. You're going to, I want to see obedience. I want to see righteousness and stinky fruit. And then he whistles and the nations come. You see, the the picture being painted here is of the nations being obedient to God would his own people have been disobedient. That's the contrast that Isaiah is painting for us here. And so they come quickly and they come speedily. None is weary, none stumbles, none slumbers or sleeps. Not a waistband is loose, not a sandal strap is broken. Their arrows are sharp, their bows are bent, the horses' hooves seem like flint and the wheels like the whirlwind. The whole picture here is one of success, one of efficiency, when everything is ready. Bows bent mean they're back ready for action. This is an efficient army working and everything is a picture of these Gentile nations being obedient to God. And the contrast couldn't be clearer. We've just come from a previous verse that's talking about roots and blossom being burnt up. The entirety of Israel being judged to be worthless. And here the Gentiles are, the hooves are right, the bows are right, the arrows are right, everything's right. 
It's that contrast between obedience and disobedience. The nations are doing God's will. And in that context, only obviously in that context, they're viewed as being obedient to God. Then we're told in verse 29 that their roaring is like a lion. This, this confused me at first. It took me a little while to work this out, to be honest with you. Some versions here, some of you in your translations in front of you, may have the phrase, a young lion. There are different words for lions in the Bible, believe it or not. And this is the, this is the one for a young lion. And then I looked at another translation, a more paraphrased one, and it specifically said a full-grown lion. And I'm like, make your mind up. Is this a baby lion or a big lion? What is it? And the answer is that the word actually is, is translated correctly in both ways. It's a young lion in the sense that it's not an old, weak lion. So if you're thinking of lion cub, you've totally missed the point. The picture is one of a lion in its prime. It is, uh, you know, put it this way. I might be middle-aged. Maybe I'll confess to that. I might be around the middle-aged kind of time right now. And I still like to run. But I'm not at my peak. <laughs> I'm not, I would be better, I would have an advantage if I was 10 years younger in my running. I'm now at the point where I'm going to predominantly get slower as I get older. The idea here is of, of the lion is not that it's a baby, but it's young enough to be at its peak. It's athletic, it's strong, it's hungry, it is a young, powerful lion. That is the picture being painted. And as well as there being multiple words for lions, there's multiple words for roaring believe it or not. And this particular word of, uh, used here to speak of roaring is a pouncing roar. Judges 14 uses it in the same way. And the idea is that the lion roars in, uh, uh, before it pounces, before it attacks, and the idea is that it's going to frighten its enemy, paralyze them with fear. And so there's a lion goes, Rah! and you go, huh? and you freeze. You know, if you see a roaring lion, what you need to do is start moving as quickly as you can. But when it roars, you're trapped. Kind of like a, a deer in the headlights. We have that expression, don't we? So a, a deer's on the road and a car comes along. And right now, deer, the best thing for you to do would be to move quickly. But the headlights are there and it goes, huh? Deer trapped in the headlights. The same idea with the lion, that it roars and it's... Uh, its prey is paralyzed with fear, giving it the advantage. And that's why it roars like a lion, like the young lions, they roar, they growl and seize their prey and carry it off and none can res rescue. And so the foreign army here is uh, pictured and it's going to seize and carry off its foe. But I think what is fascinating is that as we come from verse 29 and into verse 30, we do what Isaiah typically does, which he goes from illustration to application. And so Isaiah is talking in these terms of illustration, and then he says, they will growl over it on that day like the growling of the sea. And if one looks to land, and behold, distress and darkness, and the light is darkened by its clouds. And so, on that day, this lion, this growling, is going to be like the growling of the sea. Remember, in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, the sea is viewed negatively, a place of darkness, a place of death. Sheol is, is, is likened to the sea, the place of death because the sea was such a frightening place for them. And thus, by implication, it was the place of the demonic realm. Um, going even back to the beginning, the book of Job, Leviathan. Um, and by the way, I, I may not have mentioned this. Some of you may not know this. I know some of you do. But um, the, the book of Job has a satanic inclusio. Do you remember inclusios are those bookends where you have one at the beginning and one at the end. And the book of Job starts with Satan going before God and him saying, hey Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And the book of Job ends with God's sovereignty over Leviathan. And Leviathan is representative of Satan and he is a sea monster. And I do believe that, there, that it was 
probably what we would call a dinosaur kind of sea creature, that there was literally a Leviathan that existed in Job's time, but nevertheless it is used as imagery of Satan because it's in the sea. So the sea is viewed negatively. So the growling of the lion is seen like the growling of the sea. This is an impending death. And then it says, and if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and distress. So here's the picture. You're on the sea. The sea is growling and roaring. Where do you go to be safe? You've got the waves coming over you. You're on a boat. The boat's about to sink. Where do you want to be? On dry land. That's safe. And what he's saying is, there's no safety on land. If you look to the land, behold, there is darkness and distress, and the light is darkened by its clouds. And clouds linked here with darkness, I believe, is due to the dark, uh, clouds being so often in the Old Testament part of the manifestation of the presence and glory of God. And that's where we go from the illustration through to the application. That, yes, this is an army, that it is a Gentile army, it is like a lion, it is like a roaring sea, but who is it at the start of this section who summons that army, who places that signal flag on the mountain, who whistles and calls them? It's Yahweh, it's God himself. And therefore, I think the clouds at the end of this section is a little inclusio of Yahweh. It is Yahweh again who is the one who has brought about this darkness. So if we put the whole of the section together, we have a roaring lion freezing its prey, a roaring sea, impending death and judgment. That's your imagery. The imagery is, is, is uh, picturing what's going to literally be an invading Gentile army, and that whole thing is surrounded by God. God is sovereign over all of this. God is going to bring judgment, and he is going to bring that judgment through an obedient Gentile army upon the disobedient people of his own. His own vineyard, his own beloved, they are going to be judged the, by the irony of an obedient Gentile army. And so we conclude chapter 5 with a description of the destruction of the vineyard. And as one commentator says at this point, it looks like all hope is extinguished. We know if we've been through the five chapters that it's not, because intermittently in these first five chapters, what we had was we had God saying, I'm going to bring judgment, I'm going to bring judgment, and there's this sin, it's got to be dealt with, and then we see, but I'm going to keep my covenant promises. Saw that in uh, chapter two. Then we had judgment and judgment and judgment in chapter three, and then we come to chapter four, and we see, but God's going to keep his covenant promise to Israel. So we have this, this judgment and there's no hope and then there's hope. Then there's judgment and then, but then there's hope. And then now we see this destruction of the vineyard and we end this foundational section. We end this first section of Isaiah with the, with the picture of all hope being extinguished. And when we come into this incredibly deep and rich chapter. And by the way, if you've ever looked at Isaiah 6, you're not going to see it as you're going to see it now if you've been through the first five chapters. Because all the themes and the imagery that we've seen in the first five chapters is carried through. The holiness of God, the trembling of a temple, the, the, the judgment um, that, is, that is due to Israel. And that creates the whole picture that we're about to have. And there is no hope. What is a holy God going to do with the vineyard that must be burnt and destroyed? And that's what's going to be resolved in chapter 6. The introduction of God maintaining his holiness, expressing his holiness, and yet redeeming his people and keeping his covenant promises. How do those things happen? The book of Isaiah is going to tell us, and the beginning of that is in chapter 6. And that's where we're going to turn to next time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a holy and righteous God. We thank you that your wrath and your anger and your judgment is holy and right and just and as it should be. But far more than that, Lord, 
we thank you that you are a merciful God. That despite the sin of Israel, despite the destruction of the vineyard, despite the judgment that comes, that you in your nature are so loving, so gracious, so merciful, so patient, that you keep your covenant with them. And that love and that grace and that covenant faithfulness is why we are not destroyed. It's why we get to, despite our sin, to spend eternity with you. Redeemed with holy garments in fellowship with you. We praise you, Lord, for your redemptive work. And as we see the beginning of it unpacked in the coming weeks in Isaiah, may we each time rejoice that it applies to us, that we are your redeemed, that we have been made holy, and that your mercy and your grace has reached out even to us. Praise to your name. Amen.